Hello folks, we're back with this week's news from the world of Warcraft. I was planning to talk about how slow a week of news it's been, but then Blizzard went and dropped a couple of bits of updates, so let's dive straight into things. A couple of weeks ago, Blizzard released their second wave of previews for the new hero talents that will be added to the talent selection in the War Within expansion. Blizzard said at the time that they wanted to share these early so they could get feedback and plenty of time to be able to make any necessary adjustments and it appears that this has been a very good decision for Blizzard. It's fair to say that the talents have had a bit of a mixed reception, with the Frostfire Mage Tree being very well received, but some of the other previews turning out to be a bit less popular, particularly the, the Oracle Priest Tree which was being heavily criticised for leaning hard into a new version of Power Infusion and effectively being a light version of a support spec. Now on Thursday, Blizzard posted an update for the Oracle tree to say that after reviewing the feedback and some internal testing, they do plan to completely revisit this tree and specifically calling out plans to do something about the power infusion element. Now there have been I think some genuine concerns in the community about the overall impact of hero talents so this is a very welcome update as it does demonstrate that Blizzard are indeed open to taking on that feedback. Personally I'm a protection paladin main and the lightsmith paladin preview didn't really hit the spot for me. It seems to me that it will promote an overly complicated playstyle particularly for a tank but I've also been aware that there will be a second option for my spec so I didn't feel that it was really necessary necessary at that point to throw up the panic flag at least until I see what that other option is and whether it'll work better for me albeit it obviously wouldn't be ideal if we get two options that were so polarized between good and bad that it only offered the illusion of choice now that said I think Blizzard's reaction to this feedback does give me some more confidence that we'll see some more improvements it does also emphasize the benefits of getting early feedback in so if you have worries or thoughts about your specs hero talents assuming that you've already got a preview for them do get onto the forums and speak up before it's too late about this you genuinely I think do have an opportunity you know to influence Blizzard's decision making here also hopefully the team will get more of these previews out soon I'm very cautious that not all of the specs have been covered yet and obviously as the more time goes on the harder it will be for Blizzard to make any adjustments for feedback so keep your fingers crossed that we'll see some more of these in the coming weeks. The other main announcement from Blizzard was a significant and retrospective bluff to the bad luck protection for Firelith, the legendary axe drop from the Myrdrasil raid that took effect on Tuesday. Since that announcement, I've seen a lot of folk reporting that they did indeed get it to drop. This buff is very welcome as the drop rate of the axe has been the source of quite a fair bit of critical feedback. One of the biggest issues honestly in my opinion is that by this time in the season a lot of players will have achieved most of their goals for the season and therefore don't really get the benefit from the axe when it drops. Now Wowhead did some data mining of the hotfixes and they believe that 15 Harak for heroic kills or 7 mythic kills should take you to 100% drop chance, albeit this is heavily caveated by Wowhead as it's not possible for them to be 100% certain their data definitely relates to the legendary. If you're worrying, wondering about normal, the drop rates in normal are extremely low, by week 15 you're only around 8% drop chance, so good luck if you only do the normal raid. Now I don't know about you but part of the fun of a big ticket drop item is being able to use it. I personally got the X just last week. The problem is that I mean protection paladin which means I can't even wield it. I obviously could do it on my alt but you know the hardest content I do in that character and retribution is likely to be time walking dungeons. There's a bunch of Retribution Paladins and DKs in my raid team who could make really good use of it and yet I'm actually the first person to see it drop and honestly that's more annoying than exciting for me. Now in the team's announcement of the change they did acknowledge this issue explaining that while their current philosophy is they do want us to enjoy reaching a done point the legendary was intended to be the exception to this rule and they said that it was intended to be a special reward that using their words demonstrates a display of excellence in the most challenging content. Now 
I don't know about you, but I'm a loss to understand how winning a random roll in a normal raid on an I level 487 character meant that I demonstrated excellence in the most challenging content. But yeah, go figure. Now, while the RNG element has been the source of most of the criticism I've encountered, honestly, in my opinion, it's not the only issue with the acquisition now that I've actually experienced the questline. First up, when the item dropped, it looked exactly like a normal weapon. On equipping it, my character did an animation and well, that was it. I didn't get a pop-up quest, I didn't get any indication that anything had happened. Which really surprised me as I know that you don't actually get the weapon from the start of the quest line. So then I looked at my character and lo and behold, yeah, no weapons equipped. I've got an item I need to collect in my bag. Now, that's fine for someone like me that follows Wowhead and all the other news in the community and all that stuff, but imagine what that's like for a player who doesn't follow all of that news and maybe doesn't even know the axe exists. And yes, there are people out there like that. They get this awesome looking weapon, they equip it, something funny happens, but that's it. It's only when they notice they've no weapon equipped that they realise instead of actually getting a really cool weapon, what they've got is a really long and grindly quest line. Personally, I've already felt like the quest line was more of a punishment than a reward, and I think it's going to even feel worse, you know, if you didn't actually know that was coming up. Now the quest line overall, honestly, I, I found it pretty annoying. I had to do 12 super blooms, which as they are time gated, I had to do it over several days. You know, the minimum elapsed time to do that would be just over 12 hours, but you know, most people don't have time to put 12 hours in in one sitting. So I just imagine how long this is going to take for a player who maybe only does maybe four or six hours gameplay out of raiding every week. One of the other quests that I found annoying was the one that required getting some drops from rares. In order to get those drops, you have to use an item to attune to them. Easy enough, except that item, you have to be out of combat to use it. Now that, okay, that's not a massive issue for rares themselves, but the items you're farming also drop from the Super Blue Men boss, even though there's no real a clear indication that that's the case in the game because that end boss isn't even flagged as a rear so how do you know that you can get them from it especially given you can't use the item in combat and if you're contributing to the event you're going to be in combat because you're you know fighting all of the eds at the end so the only way you're ever going to work that out is if you happen to notice a wowhead comment which is how i found out about it and you know even once you do know to actually use the item, I had to run away from the area before the boss spawned just to get out of comment. And I, I, I'm not really a fan of that. I like to actually contribute to the events and, you know, having to run away in the AFK for a bit, you know, it's it just feels a bit icky, you know. And add in the extreme cost, which for me, when I checked the auction house prices, was 170k gold from the follow-ups to that. And... If you're not in a very active guild, the need to somehow find three crafters in your server that are willing to help, and good luck with that in a low pop server. As a tank main, honestly, I didn't actually feel it was worth the effort to get the legendary. I've got the items now sitting in my bank, I would just need to buy the materials and find a crafter, but I, I haven't actually got round to doing it, which kind of just adds to that icky feeling knowing that there are other people in my raid team for whom this would be absolutely awesome. And you know, I, I admit, I would feel different if I made Retribution, but I do think that for less active players, players that don't have a lot of gold, it just, I think this just feels super, super punishing. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't mind the game asking us to put some effort in for a centerpiece item like a legendary, but combining this with an RNG drop reward, and I'm using rewards in inverted commas here, feels just a bit too much for me. I personally think that big ticket items like this just work better when it's something that needs to be worked towards a little bit of, of at a time over a period of time it just makes it feel much more satisfying when it's something that you've actually put effort into rather than something that you win in the role of a device and a design like this i think in effect sends out a message that to play wow it's absolutely necessary to keep up with online guides and news sites which while good for content creators 
isn't, in my view, very good for the game. Both players and even developers have often expressed sadness at the way that WoW always seems to be solved and guide-driven rather than discovery-driven. But for ever to get to that point where it is discovery-driven, I think the team needs to do a much better job that about making things like this self-explanatory in game and make it much less punishing, less punishing, should I say, not to be keeping up to date. Now, I do think the team probably have realized the RNG element hasn't landed well. I'm just hoping that they're also aware of the broader picture and they have that on their radar, especially as they're probably quite deep into planning out the rewards for the war within. The rewards side of the game has actually improved a lot in Dragonflight, especially with the awesome upgrade system and the way that they've been using vendors to provide bad luck protection for cosmetics. But these super rare items in the raid, I think, have been a bit of a rare miss for them. But what about all of you? How have the legendaries and super rares been for you in Dragonflight? Are there other ways to acquire legendaries that you'd like to see the WoW team implementing in the game? Do let us all know in the comments down below. Now, moving temporarily outside the game, this week we've seen a couple of new lore-based books turn up in major online bookshops. The first is The Voices Within, a series of short stories for The War Within starring Anjun, Ganjun, Thrall, Illyria Windrunner and a few others. This is currently due for release in November, but be warned, in my experience, these release dates for WoW books often change. So. Don't be surprised if it comes out a bit later than that. I'm pretty interested in this book. Gazlo's always been one of my favourite characters, so I'll definitely be looking forward to getting my hands on it when it does come out. Now, I personally don't think we should read much from the release date of this book, to be honest. The Dragonflight equivalent was delayed by close to a year after the expansion launched, and it is fairly routine for pre-order dates for WoW books to be changed multiple times before they come out. So I'm not necessarily thinking that this will mean that the next expansion will come out in November. I, I still have a suspicion that we'll see the expansion a bit sooner than that. Now, the other book is Exploring Azeroth Islands and Isles, which continues a series of books which have been covering Azeroth continent by continent. This one covers the Broken Isles, Kotiris and Zandalar, and is based around a sea voyage by Lothramar and Therissa. Now these books have often contained some quite nice snippets around lore, uh, which update the lore of the individual areas and bring them up to, to the current day on Azeroth. For example, the Northrend equivalent told us that the old god Whispers are still causing a lot of issues up there, something which I think might be quite relevant for the upcoming expansions. Now, now, the series has had a few criticisms as well, especially the Kalimdor book, which portrayed the troll Zekhan as illiterate and had some problematic references to Goblin. But overall, I, I found the series to be pretty enjoyable if you do like lore. So I'd certainly recommend giving this a use. And by the, on that subject, did you know, for example, that Lily Stormhow is... Uh, uh, no, actually, that would be spoilers. At that moment, this book is scheduled for an October release. Now, it's also worth mentioning that there's a tarot card pack coming out which is based in World of Warcraft art. There isn't a lot of details about this beyond a potential November release, but I suspect this will be something that could well be of interest, not just to people who enjoy tarot, but also people who enjoy World of Warcraft art and memorabilia. Now back to the game and over to Classic where Phase 2 of Season of Discovery is well underway. Now the new PvP event in Stranglethorn has proven to be causing a lot of issues mostly related to the layering system. As well as some lag issues, players have been reporting issues with it being underpopulated or even cases where people in groups are ending up in different layers and not able to play together. One of the senior game producers, Tom Ellis, took to Twitter to share in depth the solutions the teams are working on and also frankly discussing some of the ongoing issues. He then went on to put out another tweet where he discussed in some depth how both the layering and sharding systems work and the limitations and issues of the technology. Now that was a super interesting insight into how the game works and I'd highly recommend giving them a read if you're interested in the tech side of the game. I'm going to put a link to the tweets in the description. 
Both Tom and game producer Agrend, who is also very active in Twitter, are brilliant advocates for the classic team within the community with their open, informative and often frank communications. It's a shame that there's no counterparts for this in the modern version of the game. While the WoW team have gotten better with the communication since BFA, it's not perfect, especially when things go wrong. Far too often when the modern game has serious issues, Blizzard just slaps into silence with the CS Twitter feed issuing updates that give off a very strong vibe that they also don't really get any updates from the team and what's actually going on. Now, given the premium price that Blizzard charges for World of Warcraft with its subscription and full price expansions, I do feel that this approach falls quite a bit short of providing the premium experience that I think the players have a right to expect. And having someone like Tom or Agren being able and willing to proactively update in these circumstances would do a lot to, I think, both settle frayed player nerves but also make us feel like the team are actively listening to us and are actively engaging to us even when things are going not so well so certainly uh, yeah i think that's definitely something i'd like to see but at least for now I'm, I'm not totally all that confident that we will finally this isn't news as such but wowhead has spotted that the website gamedesignskills.com has a bunch of retrospectives from wow game designer alexander brazzi including the mist of pandaria warlock redesign and some bosses from original burning crusade karazhan these are fascinating insights into how is or perhaps was made so if you're interested in taking a bit of a peek behind the curtains or if you're interested in game design generally i definitely recommend taking a look at those i'm going to post a link to the site in the description down below anyways as you can tell it kind of has been a bit of a slow news week hopefully you've found these more opinion based pieces a little bit interesting if you have found the video interesting do please hit that subscribe button down below and hit the bell icon so that you get notified whenever i upload a new one and also hit that like icon that lets both me and youtube know that you'd like to see more of this type of discussion based content anyways that's all for now and i will see you all again soon